All right, guys. Well, let's get going here. If nobody's, or if we've got some people not here yet, they can watch the replay and get caught up. But I have Mr. Adrian Smoot on here from My Wife Buys Mobile Homes and uh, Lifestyle REI. Um, I've been diving into, I've seen Adrian for years. Um, uh, we're in some common groups and you were, a, I believe, a member of the uh, uh, family reunion uh, REI group, maybe, possibly, but, but I've seen you around for a long time. And, you know, like probably many of the people that you've dealt with, I, I've spotted your branding really quick, right? And I'm like, this guy's really good at marketing himself. So when I started Wholesaling Partners and I, you know, and I started doing this podcast, I thought, you know, I want to get Adrian on here because I need somebody really, you know, versed in mobile home investing and, um, and, and the other things you do, like I said, branding and marketing and all that stuff. So anyway, welcome to the podcast. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me, man. So let's dive in. And I know everybody starts this way, but why don't you just tell everybody real quick how you got into mobile homes and what, what your background is. So my quick version of my story is I started out as a tenant, like a lot of us do. We don't usually buy a house first and a really, really bad tenant. We were renting, I grew up in Plant City, Florida, mm -hmm. and then we started renting in the Brandon area, so in between kind of where you're at and where I grew up. Okay. But we were bad tenants. We have eviction notices for spaghetti wrestling, pudding wrestling, mud wrestling, parking a motorcycle in the living room. So essentially, you don't rent to 20-year-old Adrian and his friends. But because I'm a problem solver, which is what we do at heart as real estate investors, I bought a house. I solved the problem. Then I learned how bad of tenants we were because I had to deal with them. <laughs> but I moved my friends in. I rented them rooms that divide up my mortgage so I lived for free. So that whole house hacking thing uh, before I didn't even know what it was. Right. This is like 20 years ago. Fast forward a little bit. I said, hey, why don't I do this again? Next time, maybe I would make some money instead of break even. The bank said, sure, you can do it again, but you'll lose a little bit every month. Don't worry, real estate goes straight up. The long story short there is when I went to refinance two years later, real estate was going down, that uh, big 08, 07 crash. And I went from losing a little bit every month to a little bit more because I had the adjustable rate mortgage that we all yeah. know about. So I lost or gave up the house as a short sale. Okay. A few years later, I didn't give up. I got back in the business. I bought some more houses by the bank's financing. And then I was like, we got to be at the top. I didn't have any real data. Like looking back, I don't even know what I was basing things on. But I had that short sale in the back of my head. And I was like, I can't have that happen again. It was a little bit of ego talking, which can be a good at times. But that's how I found the niche of mobile homes. Okay. Started talking to the seasoned investors at the RIA meetings. You know, the ones that have been in the business so long, they don't need to do another deal, but they love the business. And they talked about mobile homes. Since then, I've transitioned my entire business to the single unit mobile homes with the land. Not the parks, not the units within the parks, the single unit with the land. And a lot of the reason is because I love cash flow, predictable right. money that I can eat off of every single month. Yeah, that's the nice kind of game, right? That's it. Yeah. I know when I was, I, you know, I, I picked up um, when you were coming on, I picked up a copy of your book. Uh, also got it on. Uh, audiobooks because I like to listen and have a hard copy, but for anybody, right, looking for it. Um, but I noticed that I thought we were similar in that way. I was, I was, uh, uh, I was a mess when I was a kid. When I was 20 years old, you didn't want to rent to me either. I was laid on rent all the time, right? I was, I was a mess. So I thought, man, Adrian and I have something in common there. Um, but, uh, but it's good learning lesson, right? You 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 were a bad tenant. I was a bad tenant, you know. And you you learn from that and you grow from that. And uh, and I think the important lesson there is you took action, like you said, you're a problem solver, and you took action and and slipped into mobile homes. So, um, tell us about once you got into it. Once you got into it, um, you. I, I, I emphasize this to people all the time. When you get into a business like this, into wholesaling or in mobile home investing or anything, you can't 
just kind of do it right. If you're, if you're going to do it, you have to go all in and do it. And I noticed in your book, you were talking about how you would go out and you would do 50 signs a week, bandit signs, put out the signs. You were going to RIA meetings. You're talking to the old timers in the business and all that. And I, and I try to emphasize everybody how important that is. When you decide to do this, you've got to go all in on it. So if you could talk to us about that for a minute, how, what did your mind said, okay, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do it hard. I love that you're starting out here because this is such an important topic. And this is where I think most people don't become successful is because of this one piece. I'll back up a little bit. So the first 11 ish years of my real estate career, I was a hobby landlord. I wouldn't have said that at the time I said, I would have said, I know what I'm doing. Right. But looking back, I was definitely a hobby landlord. I was doing a few things. I was probably breaking some fair housing laws because I didn't get good education. Then I dabbled in the stock market. You know, I played, we'll say, shiny object syndrome. You know, how am I going to make money? Sure. I was very fortunate that I had very low expenses. And uh, my wife, actually at that time, girlfriend, we were both very frugal. And she became an RN. And we decided, I'm going to go all in on this real estate thing. And we're going to live off of her income. Now, that meant we couldn't go on very fancy vacation. You know, we didn't go up in uh, spending as her income went up. And I was right. still working on the side. But I went all in, as you mentioned. I was going to the RIA meetings, as you mentioned, four to eight a week, every single week, within a two-hour drive. If she was at work, I was at a meeting. If she was sleeping, I was at a meeting. And I did that probably eight solid months until I started doing some deals and then, you know, the money coming in became, all right, well, you're going to go here instead of spending the time at the meeting, but I right. still kept going because you got the education, you got the networking and I just love meetings. The signs that you <laughs> mentioned, it was 50 a week, every single week. A lot of people love to take off the holidays. I didn't because that means only my signs are out and not yours. Right. And it means code enforcement's probably not collecting. So I got a few more days of the signs out. I went the longest. I went as eight months without doing any deals, which got very tiring. Then I did one deal that paid for three years worth of signs. So it's That'll the consistency. It. And I used to think that everyone kind of had the consistency until a friend pointed out, he's like, you're really consistent. Yeah. And that's one of the things I believe that has separated me, allowed me to be very successful, is I just do that simple but yet very hard thing that every single right. day I do the same thing over and over to build the business. That's I, and again, I you know, I'm everybody watching and everybody and wholesaling partners and you know that I talk to through the wholesalers toolbox and all my things that I've got going on. I I try to emphasize so hard that you 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 have to be consistent and you have to go all in because I'll get people email me and say, Oh, you know what? I went driving for dollars on uh, this past weekend and I went to 10 houses and nobody called me, you know, and I'm like you have, I mean, you have to do a thousand houses, right? You have to put out thousands of signs, right? It's all about getting in the repetition of just doing what you have to do. Forget about the deals. The deals will come, right? But do your marketing, whatever it is, Every week, in you know, week in, week out. And, and the only thing that I believe we can truly control is giving the offer. I cannot make you buy, uh, sorry, sell me the property. You know, I can give you a different offer. I can keep changing it. But I cannot change your mind. But I can 100% control giving you the offer. So my job is to give offers. I can control that. And if I set a goal for offers, then I can be 100% on my goals. If I set my goal as I'm going to buy 10 homes, that's hard to control. Yes, we can back in the numbers mm -hmm. and say, all right, it's going to take X amount of offers to buy properties. But I like something easier. I can set so many offers. And if I do that, I know in the very big picture, it's going to average out that I'm going to yeah. buy X number of properties. So every time I get a no, all right, cool. I'm a <laughs> no closer to my yes. Yeah, it's it's crazy and i'm not going to go on into like all my different careers and the backstories but but when i started in sales when in my early 20s i sold forklifts for a living 
And I knew, because I knew the numbers, I knew if I did so many calls and so many quotes, it would equal so much in sales for the year, right? It might not come from this business or that business, but it will come. And so the law of averages are 100% real, right? If you figure out, okay, this is my path and this is what I'm going to do, I have to do 50 signs a week. I have to go to eight real estate meetings a week and, and just keep doing it. The success is going to come, right? You went a while and didn't do a deal, but now look at you, right? Now you're, now you've got this mobile home empire built, right? From yeah. that consistency. And I, my coach and I were talking about one day, we both believe that you have to do or maybe even spend X amount of time and dollars on marketing but the deals don't always come from that marketing. It's the effort put out. And a lot of times my deals come from a different direction. Right. So it's just the effort. There's some like energy thing out there. You put effort out and they come, may not be in that same form. And it happens to both of us very often. Maybe the law of attraction. Yes. <laughs> right. And we can go all down the woo-woo route. I love that. <laughs> Hey, when, why we're talking about consistency and and the marketing and all that stuff? Let's talk about for a minute. We were talking before you hopped on here today. You you weren't feeling that great this morning, right? Yeah, I I woke up pretty sick this morning. Uh, you might be able to hear me a little stuffy, but I said nope. I already committed to be on the show, and it's a live show at that. Yeah, so I've got to get myself ready. This is no different than going to a seller appointment. If I were to say, nope, I can't make it to a seller appointment, then they're just going to call you. They're going to call the next person and I'm going to lose out on it. So I did what I needed to do. I took another nap. I had more caffeine than I normally have because <laughs> I needed to bring a little bit more energy. And I did the those things. Now, after the show, I might have a little bit of a, a crash for it, but I have the time allowed. Right. And I can shift it around. That's one of the beautiful things about being an entrepreneur is we can shift our days and weeks. Yes, I have some blocks in like this. Mm -hmm. I have to be there. But then we have other time that maybe I'm just not going to get the desk work done today that I had planned. But doing those hard things, uh, I'm a very big David Goggins fan. Mm -hmm. And that's always in my head. Uh, I even was listening to Andrew Huberman. He's like a neuroscience and everything. He was talking about when we do hard things that we don't want to do, it grows a certain part of our brain. It doesn't necessarily get easier, but we get better at doing hard things. And I think that's one reason today was easier than it would have been five years ago to get up and say, I'm getting on this show regardless. And before that, I did my miracle morning. That's one of my must do things. It's a Howard Elrod miracle morning to get me in the right mindset and the right energy to be on here. And I do that every day. So then when the hard days like today come, it's just that little bit easier. So we've got you at your worst is what you're saying. If this is your yeah. worst, you're doing yeah, it. Yeah, right. it really is. I mean, I, 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 I've already taken two naps today. <laughs> so you, you, so you mentioned a couple of books is the, and I, I was watching another podcast with you and you were talking about a book that you were currently reading. I think about a month ago, feel the fear and do it anyway. Mm, yes. Right? Kind of goes into that, right? You, 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 there's some things in life, and especially people getting into this business, and I talk to people about that a lot. They're scared to start. They're scared to take action, right? But but like that title of the book, and, I'm, and I didn't read the book, so I'm just assuming what the message is in the book, but you have to do it anyway, right? You're scared exactly. or, you're, or you're sick or you're, you, know, you don't feel like it or whatever, but you, you have to push through that. Yeah, and I don't even remember the Susan something is the author. It's from the 80s, and it feels like brand new science. <laughs> you know, this, this stuff isn't new. We're just starting to understand the actual science and what's happening in our body behind the scenes. Right. Uh, I look at it as that consistency. We can all do it when it's easy. My time to actually get a little bit of edge against the rest of, you know, I don't think of people as competition, but my edge is to do it when it's really difficult. That's when most people are going to stop. Quit. And when it gets sure. extremely difficult, that's even if I do it halfway. I just do something. It keeps the habit for me, but then it gives me that edge to break away from the re regular crowd. 
Yeah. There are, in, in, you know, so many people try to break into real estate and that's the difference, right? It's, it's pushing through when other people quit, right? Because, you know, somebody else, they might put out bandit signs once and go, this sucks. I'm not going to do this anymore, right? You know, you're, you're nailing up that first one and you're like, is everybody driving by looking at me? Are they oh, gonna yeah. like, are they going to scream obscenities at me when I put up the sign or, or when you make your first cold call or whatever you're like, this is rough. But the successful people push through that, right? They 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 push through. Um, let's talk about about that for a minute. About pu- after you push through, right? And and you start you start getting response to your marketing and your your calls and all that stuff for a wholesaler because that's my biggest audience. Is what are the opportunities out there for? mobile home investing. I know you do a lot of buy and hold, right? But what about wholesaling? What do we, you know, does it, does it have to be on its own land? Can, can you wholesale in a park? I mean, give us the lowdown on if I'm a wholesaler, what kind of opportunities does mobile home investing open up to me? I think there's the most opportunity in the mobile home space right now for wholesalers than ever, because it's still a very hidden niche. My first experience with mobile homes was actually I wholesaled it. Actually, I'll back up. My very first experience is I bird dogged it for zero dollars. And I saw that he made eighteen thousand dollars in two weeks. <laughs> and that was like, you know, putting a little dagger in my back. And you're like, I didn't play that one right. Well, it gets worse uh, because he had a podcast and I listened to him tell the story about it for four episodes in a row. <laughs> And it was like, he just kept wiggling the dagger around, but he did ask me, do you want anything for this? And I kept telling Gavin, no, Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, you've given me a lot of CMA. He helped me a lot. And I didn't see the value there. And then I watched what he did and he made about 18 K. I was like, I missed something. So that really woke me up. There's a lot of money in wholesaling. Now you have to find the right buyers. There's definitely not as many buyers. There's becoming more. And you have to find the right ones and then learn the numbers. They're a little different. You know, overall, I would say it's about 80% the same as, we'll say, your traditional real estate, your site-built homes. Mm-hmm. But we traditionally pay less. I mean, we have a, a hurricane missile, you know, a tornado missile. We have something that is not always as strong. Uh, I'll split up mobile homes kind of in two categories, and that's the 1960s, 1970s. And then the 1990s and newer. The 80s are just kind of going to be a middle ground. The 60s and 70s, there is almost no appraisal value. There's value to me is cash flow coming in. Right. But in Florida, I can't even get insurance anymore. So now I have to buy it that I'm going to self-insure. I'm willing to do that. But you got to give it to me at the numbers that I'm willing to do that. Mm -hmm. And that just changed uh, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. The 90s and newer... They're much more similar to a site built home. So you got to find your numbers. You know, I think a lot of people when they're starting out in the mobile homes or sorry, in the wholesaling space in general, they find some legit buyers, you know, the ones that actually close and you meet them. That's why I'm a fan of going to meetings over and over again. Right. Because then you see who's been there and who has a good reputation. And the way I started in the wholesaling world is, you know, I'd, Hey, David, I got this property. It's not under contract yet. Can I send it over to you and tell me what you, you'd pay? And then I would go back and get it for a few thousand less. And I just did the pure trust. And I had no one ever go behind my back. You know, I, I didn't just see you one time at a meeting. You know, it was right. the rapport building side of it. So I had people that do that a lot with me in my little buying area. So you got to find the people that are buying them, but you can wholesale them. Now, that's all mainly the home and land together. That's a real estate transaction. Mm -hmm. You're going to put down the legal description, and most likely at the very end of that, it's going to say together with 1972 single wide VIN, and it has that. So that's kind of how you tell it's a home and land together. Right. Can you do just the home, as you mentioned? You can. That's going into the DMV world, the car world. Uh, there are a few states like California that create a whole other arm of the government to go over just mobile homes. But most of the country, it's DMV. So you're just trading the title for money. The contract works a little different there. You know, the way I've always done those is a trust factor. 
you know, I, I got the uh, contract with you. And then the way I've always done is actually I went and closed at the DMV. So I right. purchased it and then resold it versus just, uh, we'll say, assigning the contract. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have to be a car dealer if you're going to get into that world a little bit. And I just didn't, I'm not a big wholesaler. I'm, like you said, I'm a buy and hold. And part of it is wholesaling was very difficult for me. I, I don't really know exactly why. Everyone has their different skill set. Sure, yeah. It's just not mine. Yeah. All right, so so on a, on a mobile home, on its own land, because I'm going to assume that, that banks aren't real fond about doing a 1970 uh, mobile home on an acre of land loan, right? So for a wholesaler going out looking for deals and finding something like that, that they can assign, what are the opportunities there of when you, when you find that property, just saying, Hey, tell you what, you know, here's a cash offer or I'll do, I'll give you full price or maybe a little bit more than you want. And you just finance it for me. Right. And then you hold that deal yourself. Right. How many opportunities do you run across that look like that? You are a hundred percent right. And I've never had anyone that has a 1960s, 1970s mobile home when I have that exact scenario that you just uh, described say, well, why don't you just go to a bank? Because they know that the banks won't finance them. Right. I don't get that excuse. I used to get that excuse all the time. Or why don't you just go to a bank? And they were right for the last, what, decade and a half that the banks were a better option. But now they're not. But for this whole time, the mobile homes in the 60s and 70s, people will accept payments on it. Yeah. So I don't use the word financing. I like payments. Payment, right. Because it sounds simple and also it doesn't imply interest. And I like to start the negotiating at zero and have mm -hmm. you work me up. Uh, we've done a lot of deals that way. Like you said, whatever you're asking, yeah, David, I could do that. If it's on payments, I saw a, uh, I went to see a uh, real estate coach or a wholesaling coach. I don't remember what she was, but it was years ago, 10 years ago. And she brought up that when she made a offer on a property, because she would be wholesaling, but she'd say, Hey, I'll give you full price on your, you know, what you're asking. If you take whatever the number was, you know, of the, of the property divided by a hundred payments, do you do okay. that strategy? I mean, like, there, her, she would do it where there was no interest, but she would just say, take whatever the call, you know, 20 grand divided into a hundred payments of 200 bucks or whatever. So I do like to, before I go, have some type of number of a monthly payment mm -hmm. that I can make money with. So as a buy and hold investor, I got to make sure that I can really make money. I have that number and then I'll have a rough number of how much I can put down. And those are the really the two numbers I care about the most as a cash flow investor. And I will give the offer. I never talk about how long. And once you come back at me, well, how long is this going to be for? Well, I'm really open to that. If you allow me to make a safe monthly payment that really helps me in my business, because I don't want to ever default for my business, but right. I don't ever want to default because of you. I don't. And when we come with that, I haven't found that people are really big on how long. Uh, I've actually, unfortunately, had a few owner finance deals. Uh, recently, I found out the seller has passed away. And so it lasted longer than them, but their heirs got it. Right. So the heirs have been getting the payments. And sometimes people want that. They yeah. want their heirs to get the payments. You know, there's all, all different reasons that people sell. Uh, Peter Fortunato teaches that. When we really find out the why, we can solve the real problem, not just right. give them a big cash number. Yeah, some people just don't want the headache anymore, right? It's yeah. not about the money. Uh, I've, I've had wholesale deals where people bring considerable money to closing just to get mm. out of it. I've had a guy that borrowed money from his 401k just wow. to get out of because he had a bad tenant and he's like, I just don't want to deal with it anymore. What do you give me? And I'm like, you know, I gave him a number and it was short of what he owed on the property. So he's like, just, just take my money. Just, just take. So you never, you never know. Yeah. I haven't had that one yet, but I'll tell you, you know, cause we're have a lot of wholesalers listening. Wholesalers love to say cash and they love to say fast closing. 
Mm -hmm. I removed those two from my marketing maybe eight years ago because I actually don't want to pay cash. I'd much rather do some type of owner financing. Right. And I took away the fast closing. I say at your convenience or uh, on your schedule because I have found most of the people I have bought from, they actually needed to close slow. And I even talked to people that were scared because the wholesaler that came before me said, well, we'll close and we'll, you'll be out by the end of the week. Well, that was scary for her. Yeah. She needed time. She actually needed to stay two weeks after closing because a lot of people don't have the money to do the physical move mm -hmm. until they get the check from the title company. And I'm comfortable letting them stay. You know, we hold back the title company holds back some money, but it's more at your convenience. What is what do you need? And we'll build the deal that way. Right. I believe your marketing still says like any condition, any situation. Yep. But you just drop the cash and fast and you know, all that stuff. Yeah. And and on that, most wholesalers always think that, you know, if you don't pay all the closing costs, because we don't offer to pay closing costs either, but I will if you negotiate in. It's an item that I let you negotiate in. But a lot of the sellers, they don't know what title company they want to use. So sure. there's a lot of times we'll split the normal closing costs and they're like, well, where do we close? Well, I've got the ladies out in this title company that have always done it. They take great care. They're third party. They're there to protect you and me. And they understand mobile homes. Yeah. Well, of course they want to go and close there then. Yeah. Yeah. Have all your have all your pros lined up, right? For situations like that. All right. So I'm so I'm gonna I'm a wholesaler. I'm gonna start doing this. When I when I make offers, you know, I'll give them a cash offer. If I want to have properties to you know, in my portfolio, maybe I'll give them a, a you know, a owner finance or a payments uh, offer. But what, what happens when I need to walk through this property and inspect it? I mean, like, how do, how do you learn that? Because it's going to be different than a regular single family property on a foundation, right? How do you get that skill? By just doing it. Honestly, that's how I've learned almost everything. You just start doing it. Now, obviously, you get some education, but you can get all the education in the world, and it won't compare to actually going there and feeling the subfloors mm -hmm. and tapping on the windowsills and seeing how the older ones, the walls are much, much thinner. You can read that all day, but until you see it and you hear that you can hear straight through the walls on a 1960s, you don't understand it. That's how I've done it. I go there and I look at that sometimes as a practice. I bought mobile homes when really my goal was to go there and investigate something I learned or to practice something I learned in class. And then they said, yes. I was like, oh, cool. I really only came <laughs> here to see this one thing that I learned about. Right. I think we get so fixated on having to close the deal. Getting inside of a mobile home having a conversation with the seller, they'll teach you a lot of things. Or, you know, like I said, you read about the walls. All right, go there and touch the walls. Yeah. So that you have real experience. So then next time you're more confident in it, you know, go there and a lot of mobile homes are in more rural areas. So go there and check out the well. Cause a lot of people have never seen that there's two different well pumps, mm -hmm. submergible, non-submergible, and just ask the seller about it. You'll learn a lot from the sellers that will then click back to what, you know, you learned in my book or wherever you learned it, you learned it on here, go and see it because then it becomes real. Right. I'm thinking, you know, when I have these conversations with wholesalers and, and they tell me that they're afraid to make a phone call, right? It, you know, I get the butterflies in my stomach. I'm afraid to call. I tell them to get on. I said, go on Craigslist in a different city, right? And start calling Fizbos and just get used to doing it. Now, when you're explaining this to me right now, I'm thinking in my head, if I were going to get into mobile home investing, I would probably start looking for maybe a park that's older, that has a lot of units for rent and going out and acting like I'm going to rent a, rent a property and just having somebody walk me through some. It's right? like you've done all this before. Uh, that's exactly <laughs> all of those things. I love the FISBO uh, work there. because. Those are usually your hardest to talk to sellers. And then right. everyone else gets easier because they're usually their price is wrong mm -hmm. and you get beat up by them. And then you go to the, the seller that's motivated. It just feels better. Yeah. Walk the property. When you switch it from being all about me, I've got to go there and buy this property. You switch the mindset to 
David, it's all about you. How can I help you? Yeah. Like there's just an energy burden of relief that comes off. And I still get caught up on this sometimes. And I've, I've done everything you just said where the phone rings and I literally shook and didn't say anything. <laughs> it's so embarrassing. Cause I, I listened to a podcast and they talked about that. I was like, no way that'll be me. And then it happened, but I got over it because a book title, feel the fear and do it anyways. Just if we're there to truly help, it gets easier. And sometimes my solution is not involving me. Yeah. I, I mentioned it when I, when I was like early twenties, I was selling forklifts, right? That was my first sales job. And I tell the story a lot, Adrian. I remember I could drive you to the first business I ever called on. You know, I picked the smallest little building that I could find that I thought would have a forklift in it. And I walked in, my mouth went dry. I was so freaking scared. Like they were going to like hit me because I was a salesman or something. Right. But I just kept doing it, you know, and it's like I, I built up the courage to go to the next one and go to the next one. Right. And, but what you just said about, about helping, worrying about helping them. That's years later. That's when I went from a good salesman to a great salesman is I stopped worrying about, Hey, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to talk them into buying a forklift. And I would go in and I'd say, what kind of problems you have? Who are you having? Like, what's, what's your situation? Let's make it better for you. And man, then my sales went off the charts, right? Same thing yeah. in, in houses and, and mobile homes. And that's an absolutely everything. You know, I actually got caught up in that and, the education world, you know, it's no secret. You go to a RIA meeting and the speaker most of the time has something to sell you. Mm -hmm. And I got caught up in my self-worth being if you bought or not. And when I, my mastermind groups and my coach helped me realize what a jerk thing I was doing in my head. And I started <laughs> reframing it and only caring about helping. Ironically, which we understand what's really happening, sales went up because yeah. all I cared about was helping. And it's going to happen in the next phase of my life, whatever that is. It never stops happening as long as we keep helping. What's the Zig Ziglar quote? Uh, if we, if you help enough people get what they want, you'll get what you want. Yeah. However, I'm sure I butchered it a little bit. I live <laughs> you by can, that. You can have everything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. Thank you. I'm yeah. a big Zig Ziglar fan. I'm sorry. And, and <laughs> you know, honestly, I... My routine before I speak a lot of times is listening to 30 minutes to an hour of Zig Ziglar and yeah. focusing on truly helping, getting the ego out of me, getting the self-centered part out of me that naturally creeps in and just refocusing. I am there to help yeah. and I'm not always a solution, but the people that I am the solution for, this is in the education world, the mobile home space, you know, I sit down with sellers or get on the phone with them when I know I am not the solution, but I want to give them some things to talk about with agents. I want to give them things to talk about with the park or whatever, like just some pointers. Hey, look at this. Here's some ways I would sell it if it was mine, but I, yeah. I'm not your buyer. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. You have to do that because you're not always the you know, wholesalers are, are notorious for doing that. They'll go out to see somebody and they're like, you know, how much do you want for your property? And, and the guy said, well, you know, my neighbor just sold theirs for 140. So I want 180, right? It's, you know, I want top dollar for it. And wholesalers are afraid to say, you know what? It's a great house, but it's not something that I buy, right? They're like, oh, somebody wants to sell and they'll put it under contract, right? And you have to understand that you're not everybody's solution. Exactly. Right? And here I got, uh, I'm starting to see a trend. So I'm a person that goes and sits down and talks. And when I do a seller appointment, I schedule three hours. And sometimes I actually hit that and go over because we are going to talk about anything and everything. And I'm going to make you bring up me buying your property. I'm going to look at the pictures that you have behind you. And I love the travel. So I'm probably going to see something about travel there. And I'm going to ask you about that trip. And I'm a truly curious person. Well, that's rapport building which I think has gotten lost today. Yeah, it has. And I do that. And I'll tell you, about a year ago, we bought a property. And the first time I sat down with the sellers, they told me about the other people that walked through the property. One person walked through, four minutes walked the whole thing, didn't say a word for, for, to them at all, and sent them a text message with an offer. 
They were pretty scared to even have anyone come. <laughs> Another person wouldn't even go to the property. Just gave them an offer over the phone and made them FaceTime. Yeah. I went there and we talked for an hour and a half. And I explained to them all of the math. How it works if you're taking the property and wholesaling it. How it works if I'm buying it. I laid out everything. How it works if they sell it to me on payments. You know, if I have to go to someone. I just tell everyone everything. everything. Well, they ended up getting a better offer than me that fit them better. Well, they called me and said, hey, we really like you better, but we need the money that this person's offering. And I said, can you give me another day to figure, to look at it? I don't know if I can match that, but I'll try. Well, I was able to match it. The wholesaler came back and offered more and they told them to go away and much meaner words and colorful words than that. Yeah. And when they bought me breakfast to sign the agreement, they said, I wish that other guy was sitting here and had to watch me sign it with you because <laughs> he was not a nice guy. Yeah. And I'm there's a, that there's more a lot more of I, people. I, I just did a, uh, a video on that. Some guy, you know, like one of these, you know, TikTok guys and how he got on like a, a verbal confrontation with a seller. And I'm like that, you know, you don't do that. Right. It's, it, but people, they don't know how to build rapport or relationships. I was thinking about it yesterday. So many people are trying to do deals via text because they're they're scared to go out and meet somebody and have those conversations. So anybody watching this, if you have problems like that, go buy the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Right. And learn how to have human interaction and how to care about somebody and what they're what they're trying to accomplish. I think you'll have much less competition by doing what you just said. The text message and the non-building report, it will work, but it is a pure numbers game. That's why people are now having to send tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of texts to yeah. even get one conversation and then hundreds of those to get a close. It will work, but you have tons of people doing it. There's not a lot of people today, unfortunately, that are willing to go spend three hours to help someone out that might not make you any money. Right. And it feels good to do that, but that goes a long ways. These days, my offer to close rate has really got up, but it's because I'm not giving as many offers, but I'm giving them to the people that are tired or scared of the text message thing. They're a little yeah. bit more old school. They want to Maybe they've never sold a property in their life. They've only bought the one property they live in. I've had that scenario. And that is a very terrifying thing. We're used to it because, or even if you've never done a wholesale deal, you're still used to the concepts of it. Mm -hmm. Some people don't even know how it works. And that's something we had. They didn't understand that we pay the title company all the money and the title company pays off the mortgage. As simple as that is to us, she thought she might have been getting ripped off because she needed to get the lump sum of money to go right. pay the mortgage off. Yeah. We have to help people through these little steps. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's techniques are going to change, right? Because when I came into the business, yellow letters were really big, right? Everybody. And then everybody started doing it. And it's like, you know, then people would get 20 yellow letters a day and they didn't mean anything anymore. And then, you know, then it's ringless voicemail. Like, oh, well, you know, we're just going to drop, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of this. Now it's SMS messaging and it just keeps going on. But going out and and ha building rapport and doing those personal relationships is going to win every time. And it's something that never goes out of fashion, right? You can do all those other things are going to wear out. But seeing people and talking through their issue and saying, how can I help you is always going to win. And it's a very long term strategy. Yeah, you may not get his deal as quick as throwing out a few hundred thousand messages, but it starts compounding. Those sellers I told the story about, do you think that they tell people about me? They were very happy. We had an emotional yeah. transaction. Someone that you text with and that's it. And I bought properties like that. And I never could get them on the phone. Personally, I don't like it as much, but that's what they're wanted. Do you think that person's going to talk about me that much? Probably not. I didn't hit an emotional trigger. Right. The people I mentioned that they didn't, they wanted the other person to watch, have to sign it. They moved to South Carolina. And he said, anytime you're driving through, you stop by for barbecue. He was a competition barbecue cooker at a while. And 
I love barbecue. So we had that conversation. They're going to keep telling people. And now that's why today my business is all networking. I don't pay for advertisement dollars. I buy some shirts for people. I buy some uh, marketing that I like to sponsor charities that I, I believe in. You know, my logo goes up there. I don't know if I'll ever buy anything because of that. Most of it is because I am out there helping people over and over and over again. And the goodwill, the pain it for, the karma, whatever you want to call it, they then tell people, hey, this is a good guy. Yeah, there's a I, I, I don't think it was a Zig Ziglar quote, maybe Brian Tracy, but it is sales is a transference of feelings. Right. Oh, yeah. And and if people feel good about you and, you know, and you're trying to help them and you feel good about them, that goes a long way. I mean, that's everything, really. You know, um, let's let's talk about about doing the, we, we mentioned uh, at the beginning of this, how, you know, you're, you were doing this in Florida and central Florida, you know, there's a lot of mobile homes here in, in Tampa Bay, but let's talk about people that are in the rest of the country in different markets. And I know you travel a lot and, you know, on the, the real estate circuit and go around and see different people, but what's the, what's the atmosphere like for mobile home investing nationwide? So people very often tell me, Adrian, you're so lucky you have all the mobile homes in Florida. Well, it's not true. Texas actually has more than us. That's because they're physically larger. Yes, we have a lot in Florida, but they are in all the states. They've been in the Alaska, I think it's since the 50s. So if they have them in Alaska, they have them everywhere else. I will say it's partially because you're not looking for them most likely. The reticular activated system in the brain, we yeah. can go that route if you want, but if you're not looking for it, you don't typically see it. I left a conference in uh, Virginia, in Richmond, sorry, in Richmond, the city. And yes, in the city, there's not as many, and this is across the country, because of tax dollars. Cities want tax dollars, and it only makes sense. A taller building is going to pay them more. Right. So they, they're trying to kind of get rid of mobile homes, push them out. But just outside the city, there's people that live in mobile homes, and there's a lot of them. Every market. The only market I have found so far that didn't have anything within two hours of the city was Minneapolis. There was nothing within two hours that was a mobile home that we're probably going to buy and rent. There were some big farms that had them. Right. But we're not going to buy you know one on 100 acres. That's, that's not business. We're probably going to wholesale that in. So look a little bit outside. There's a lot of people that want to live on a half acre, acre, two acres of land. And that's for fix and flip. The fix and flip prices have been going up the last year or so because people buy payments, right? No matter mm -hmm. investors, homeowners, we buy payments. Well, if, with interest rates going up, people can't afford homes anymore, right? Before, there's a good amount of people that were like, yeah, I don't really want a mobile home, but they're like in the middle. Well, now they can't afford the payment on the concrete or the wood frame right. home, but they still want an acre of land. They value the acre land. They want the fence. They want to have their animals. They want their privacy. We saw a lot of that with COVID. Yeah. Well, that caused the prices of the mobile homes to go up be just because of the simple supply and demand. The, the I was, was going to bring that up. Housing affordability is is rough, right, for a lot of people. So from a from a investor standpoint or a wholesaler standpoint, I mean, it's silly not to look at mobile homes because I'm, I'm sure, and I haven't been in the business, but I'm sure the activity is up on them because of affordability. Because people are like, I can't, I you know. We we when we moved back down to Florida from Michigan, we we came back, and we went to an apartment. The apartment was costing me twenty five hundred dollars a month for an apartment for a two bedroom apartment. We moved. We just rented a house here that's three grand a month for a house. It's outrageous for a house rental, right? So people are like, you know, I'm we're lucky because we can afford it, right? I do this, and my wife, you know, she works for the schools. But somebody that's a that's a you know working at a restaurant to pay a $3,000 a month house payment, the utilities and all that, they're going to start looking at other options, right? Yeah. And I love the recession resistance, as I call it, the affordable housing, the workforce housing right now, more than ever, because I believe we're either in the recession. We'll find out in the six months, a year for the recession, the government will give us a new definition of the recession, something along those lines. I believe we're closer to a recession than we've ever been in the last 15 years. If that's my belief, 
then prices are going to have to come down because when we're in a recession to household income, one of them loses their job. What do they do? They have to come down a rent level. That continues happening right. until the affordable housing space. We get more demand and we're not making much more supply. So in theory, we could actually raise our prices there. I'm not counting on that. I'm counting on the fact I will have a larger applicant pool to get yeah. the very best person in my property so that I have someone in there that can pay rent so I never go without paying my bills again. Remember that short sale I talked about? Mm -hmm. that, that was a huge ding to my ego, my credit, my integrity. I'm never letting that happen again. So I am very heavy in the affordable housing numbers. That's going to change all over the country. Yeah, We did just buy a property that we have it for rent, and I, I think we have an application right now, at eighteen fifty a month. In the Plant City area, that's above the affordable housing rent number. I ran my math at it only being rented at fifteen hundred a month, because I believe very conservatively, I may have to drop it to that during a recession. And if I don't have the numbers set there, that I can still make money. That's not a safe business. People laugh at me because I say I'm very conservative and I'm in the mobile home space. Then I spreadsheet is very conservative because I don't want to ever compromise my integrity again. That extra $350 a month, that's extra money. Yeah. But I want to be able to get by on the bare minimum number in that 1500 is the upper range of the affordable housing space. It's it's crazy how a, a, a foreclosure or an eviction or, or something years ago can affect your mindset. When I was in the mortgage business, when the housing collapse happened, right? And I had car loans and I just bought a brand new property and, and like had all these things going. And my income went from 20 grand a month to zero real quick, right? And since then, I've never financed anything, right? I'm like, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to get stuck there again, right? So it's, you know, that happens. You're just like, right? It's, it's a new it, mindset. That's exactly it. I have found like Tony Robbins, I'm very good at finding commonalities of successful people. And everyone that's been through multiple recessions, they say what you just said. Yeah. If they have some bank debt, it's very little of I'm their entire zero. portfolio. I don't, I, yeah. if I don't have the cash for it, I don't get it. It's just where yeah. I'm at. And that is a very unpopular thing in the real estate space. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> I have free and clear properties. I have lots of friends with tons of free and clear properties or free and clear portfolios. Right. I am proud that I have zero bank debt as of 2022 April. I don't owe banks anything. Now I owe people something. And I, and I would be okay with that. Right. You're yeah. because it's a because it's an asset. It's an income producing asset. But I'm talking about like car loans, credit card yep. debt, you know, all that, all that stuff. So let's I want to get on this because we're, we're running shorter on time now. But you also have the, the company uh, that the shirt you're currently wearing, the REI lifestyle. And I, I think that goes into more about promotion, right? Promoting yourself. Right. And and. Yep. Let's talk about that for a minute, because I think that's where people, I think they also have a fear of doing that, right? They have a fear of starting in wholesaling or real estate or whatever, but they also have a fear about putting themselves out there, right? And we shared a couple of pictures of yesterday of me on a horse <laughs> and you on a dinosaur, right? But like, you know, I think my, it's me, it's my age. I don't care what people think anymore, right? And, and I think you're just an outgoing guy. But but talk about for a minute, our, you know, Lifestyle REI and about marketing yourself and putting yourself out there so people notice you and people notice your mission. Thank you. So this is one of my favorite topics. I can actually talk about promoting yourself a little bit more than mobile homes. <laughs> we'll do another podcast. Mindset. We'll do another podcast and I'll let yeah. you go wild. First of all, I'm actually an introvert. And none of this stuff came really natural to me. It was very difficult at first. I really like I that. even argued the guy that told me I was an introvert, but I was like, wait, he's very smart. He's really good at the personality test. I can move over to the extrovert side, which is what it feels like. If I had four hours of these podcasts back to back to back, it would be very draining on me. When I learned that introvert extrovert is an energy thing, like how you really get filled up, then that just told me, okay. As an introvert, I'm a very light introvert. I think of it as like a scale. That means I just need a little bit of time to recharge. 
my wife, she needs a lot of time. She needs multiple hours, multiple times in a day in a whole weekend conference if she's there to mm -hmm. recharge or she is flat dead. Once you learn that, then you can prepare yourself for the meeting. So about marketing, I think that everyone has something that they love more than real estate. Real estate is a business we're talking about here, but there's something. If it's cats, if it's a bright yellow shirt, if it's a Speedo, if it's dogs, whatever it is, uh, Star Wars, if you make that topic part of your marketing, it won't feel like work. And then your people that love your item are going to want to do business with you over me every day because you have an instant connection there. Mm -hmm. And instead of going that really wide net, just go to the smaller net that is much deeper. And I used to be in B&I, and they teach that uh, pretty uh, well. And once I've started doing that, I've learned, all right, those are my people that I can help. So my original buying brand, you already mentioned it, is a T-shirt, My Wife Buys Mobile Homes. I was not seen in public for years wearing anything but this shirt. When I created Lifestyle REI, which is my education brand, so well, I'm already known for this bright yellow shirt, I'm going to keep the shirt as my logo. Right. And I just put the Lifestyle REI on it. My Wife Buys is third party. It, it kind of brings the uh, edge down a little bit. It's not about me. It's about someone else. And women are better for marketing. True. Guys rather talk to women and women rather talk to women. It's a brand new interaction. There's just a better energy feeling. As much as we try to do as guys, we have a little bit of a, a hard wall up. Uh, we can do things to lower that. So that is one of the pieces of why this shirt has worked. And I am the person next door. We talked about the sitting down, the talking. That's me. That's my personality. I am not the big corporate guy. If I was in a black suit right now, I would be uncomfortable. And you would feel that even through the, you know, internet here, you would still feel right. that I feel stiff. I think the, I, I think the branding on, on my wife buys mobile homes is genius because he, because I, you're one, you're correct. People rather deal with a woman, especially on a first interaction, right? Guys like women, women feel safer with women and all that. But I think for you, putting that on your marketing, even if you're dealing with them, it makes you a softer guy, right? You're more approachable because like he's talking about his wife on his shirt. So he's got to be a good guy. He's a good guy. He's a good husband, right? He's bringing the wife into the thing. So I think it just makes you more approachable, even if your wife's never in the, in the conversation. Yeah. So she was in the behind the scenes for a bit. Like I said, she's a little bit more uh, introvert and, she doesn't love the real estate business. She likes what it has done for our lives, but she doesn't love real estate. She This is draining for her to get on here and talk. I can talk forever about it. <laughs> so she helped with stuff. Now, she doesn't have anything to do with the business, except for the few conversations that I just need to bounce some stuff off of her for feedback as a sounding board. But the people are always asking me, well, that's so nice of you to wear your wife's shirt. What do you do? Well, I'm a billboard. Right. You know, and then I get some chuckling a little bit more. You know, she is in the business and the fact of the bank account, she enjoys that. <laughs> you know, if I, she had nothing to do ever with the business, I wouldn't be able to wear that shirt because it would be out of integrity. Right. And it's a, a icebreaker shirt. A long time ago, you probably remember the black with white lettering. It said, I buy houses. Mm -hmm. That's where this idea came from. I was like, well, I like to be different. And that shirt, I, I can't wear the same shirt as everyone else. So we came up with a shirt, my wife buys houses and mobile homes. And first four months, I got zero interactions about it. The only thing I can come up with looking in hindsight is I was not wearing the shirt with confidence. And there was an energy thing, the woo-woo stuff. Mm -hmm. that I think that's why people didn't approach me. Now, people approach me all the time with the shirt. They smile. I can see their eyes going back and forth. And then a smile happens. And so for me, I just like lighting up their day, if nothing else. And then some people, it starts the conversation. And then maybe I can help them if it's about mobile homes or not. But I had to get rid of the word house, which yeah. I push back on with uh, my group, one of my mastermind groups. I'm in. They said, you have to get rid of it. And I was like, no, I want to buy houses. I want to wholesale those. <laughs> they said, get down, focus on one thing. And I'll tell you, I still get leads on houses. 
and I don't well, have I'm any curious. marketing. You have to dig to find the link within my website that talks about houses. Yeah. And it's been a long time, but people remember you on one item. A lady I'm actually looking to help now. We've been texting for about a year. She hasn't been ready to sell yet. She said, I, if I remember right, you really deal with mobile homes. I said, yeah, that's true, but I might be able to help you with a house. It may not be for me. I might be able to connect you with the right person. I'd love to just sit down and see what the information I can give you. Yeah. I I have to imagine just your personality and your your willingness to help people. And you talked about doing doing some charity stuff. I have to imagine that that half the people that you've done business with have a picture of you on their wall. <laughs> right. That feels like <laughs> A little weird hearing that, but uh, maybe, you know, we send handwritten thank you cards out. Anyone I like to do business with, you know, I try to do that. I don't do as much as I would love because no one does that. And it's a very, uh, my mom just taught me to do that. Well, still today, after Christmas, she'll send me the text. Don't forget to send your thank you cards out. You know, this year we didn't do a thank you card. It means something, right? Nobody, nobody does that anymore. Nobody mails. That goes so far. I, we, when I was at the bank, we did that, right? And we would send out cards to people that had done loans. And I got, people would call me just about the card, right? Hey, I got your card. Thanks. I really appreciate it, right? And you're like, okay. One, it was a marketing piece, right? But that me, yeah. it meant something to them, right? And and that's, you know, it's good practice, right? Anybody, anybody you go to a, if you go to a uh, REI meeting, send out notes and say, hey, you know what, I, I love, you know, it was great getting to know you, you know, last Thursday night or something. People are going to remember you. I, I know we're getting short on time. I want to touch on that. I put a Facebook post out today with a marketing tip to collect business cards. Mm-hmm. And I'm getting the two schools of thoughts kind of arguing back and forth. The old school me, that I want your physical card because I'm doing the brain connection looking at the card, looking at you, remembering what we talked about. So when I follow up with you, I can actually mention what we talked about. Right. Then there's a new age that are like, no, I have everything. And we, I just text it or QR code it. For me, my brain doesn't remember what we talked about when that happens, even yeah. with the little picture icon. And I'm going to have to learn to adapt. I know that. I don't want to be the old grumpy man in the corner saying, ah, we do business. It's me. I'm so old school. You know, and I have the QR code. I don't try to use it from the beginning, but I know I have to adapt. It's a struggle because I want to do what you just said. I want to follow up mm-hmm. and truly show you that I know what we talked about. Well, and I'm going to tell it. you that I'll tell you the down, the downside of digital. Cause I know everybody's, you know, digital business card and the, you know, the Lincoln bio thing and all that, but the downfall of it, like people will be like, Oh, here, you know, zap my phone and I'll zap my contact into your phone. But the problem is, is then they never see it and they forget about you. Yes. Right. So even if you're doing that with people, even if you're doing a digital business card and you're like, you know, here you are, here's my contact information, all that. Send this person a note with a business card that they're going to lay on their desk and they're going to be like, Oh, I've got Adrian's card right here, you know, staring me in the face. Right. You you but, have to do it. Technology is great, but it never, like I said about the yellow letters and everything, it never replaces human, human interaction and building relationships. Right. It, my relationship isn't in here. My relationship is talking to you and getting to know you and, and all those things. Yeah, that goes with everything. I want people to buy the physical book and not the Kindle. And I started raising the price to drop sales on Kindle because how are you ever going to remember me randomly? You see this yellow book, you might remember me in a few months. You're like, oh, yeah, there's that bright yellow book. Yeah. Audio is similar because you heard me because I read it. I didn't hire anyone else. So you'll remember my voice because you listened to it for three hours. I want you to remember that. And it sparks something once away. The Kindle, I just, maybe I'm limiting my mindset. I don't believe you're going to remember me in the future from the black and white of the Kindle. Yeah. I, Amazon loves me because I always buy both. I was, I bought by the audio and then the physical copy, which I read often. I'll read it. Why the audio is playing. Right. And I'll go through it and then it will go right back here. So I always remember it. Right. So, but uh, I would love feedback on that. Uh, you're going to get it. You're going to because <laughs> for, so something I learned here, back up. I was a uh, slow learning disability. SLD is what they've called me through all of school. Basically, 
I have a learning disability and they just throw me in a corner. And then while I was writing my book, I learned I'm dyslexic. So a kind of inspirational thing, if a dyslexic guy can write a book and it's like dyslexic guy can go out and buy mobile homes. So can you, right? The reason I really brought it up is when I read my book, that was the most difficult speaking engagement I've ever had in my life because there are grammar errors in my book. And I purposely left them there because when I got over the fear of me having bad grammar out there, it still happens today. Often Facebook, I put something, someone tells me to correct it. I used to be destroyed for a day plus because that's my weak area and I, you know, just emotionally destroyed. Now, well, guess you don't have to know how to spell to buy mobile homes. <laughs> and I, I wanted it to be acceptable to not be perfect yeah. and still be able to be successful because I got caught up in that mindset and everything's got to be perfect. I'm a recovering perfectionist. So reading a book that has grammar errors, and they're not huge ones, I don't think. They're, they're smaller ones, but it was still very difficult because you go to read it the, the way it's meant, and you have to read it the way it's in the book for Amazon Audible to take it, you know, something right. behind the scenes. It was very difficult. Yeah. If, if, the, if it wasn't for Grammarly, I wouldn't be allowed in the business world. <laughs> yep. I couldn't right. could start to write a book without... AI help or something like that. Um, you know, I often talk about about my story about how I was scared. I was an in, uh, introvert as a kid. Horrible, right? Like if somebody came over and I was in my pajamas, I'd run and hide, right? Because I didn't want them to see me in my pajamas at six years old or five years old or whatever. But even getting into sales and things like that. I mean, I had a lot of friends as a young kid, but but when I had to you know, if I had to public speak or, 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 you know, walk in and do a cold call, I was, I was horrible. And if I can make it in real estate and, and, and now on YouTube and all these things, anybody can, because I was so bad. And I think we're the same in that. And, and you're trying to sp spread that message as well. What, wherever you are right now with, with, with your, you know, how you were in school, if you were a dropout, if what I mean, if you're an introvert, you can do this, right? It you just you're going to be scared, but push through it, mm -hmm. and you can and you can do this. It's just like just like I can, just like you can, anybody. And I want to speak real quick to bring the introvert extrovert thing to a next level. Introverts are traditionally better networkers. Now they're going to talk to way less people, but it's going to be a much deeper conversation. The extroverts have a little bit of a challenge because they can go and talk to lots of people, but we've all seen the person in the meeting that just goes around and gives 30 people their business card and there's no conversation. So the extroverts kind of have that challenge. They have to slow down, which can be uncomfortable for them mm -hmm. because if not, they scare away the, the introverts in the room. That makes sense because they're very high energy. Yeah. They're talking real fast and then they're on to the next person or the next topic, right? They don't slow down and have a deep conversation. I can see that. That makes a lot of sense. Yes, we just have to learn how to network with a different personality types. And it can still be challenging for me because I get high energy in the, the room and I can even have trouble coming down because I just get truly excited about yeah. the topic. And I'll start talking over people like, oh, no, no, stop. Slow down, Adrian. Slow down. You're not supposed to talk over them. And yeah, so it's... Yeah, it's I probably a, do the same. Right? It's a continuous thing. And it's not that I failed that one time. I just get to try it again the next time which is no different than going to a seller's appointment to pick up the phone. What do we do? All right, let's just improve it. There is no end goal. Like we keep moving this goal line. We just get a little bit better every single time. It's feedback. That's how you do it. Just every, every, even if you get a fraction better, every time you do it, keep on it, keep on the path. Hey, let's talk about the, the your website. I popped up here, uh, lifestyle, rei.com backslash partners or forward slash partners, I guess. Yeah, so the, the site, you do have to put a little dash in between the lifestyle and REI, lifestyle-rei.com slash partners, all lowercase. On there, I have a 14 myths debunked about mobile homes. We covered some of them. We actually didn't cover the, the big, scary, hairy one of uh, trailer trash because <laughs> there's someone for sure thinking about that. Right. But, I create a little PDF to help upgrade your mindset. That doesn't mean you have to start investing in mobile homes, 
but I don't want you to leave money on the table like I did with that $18,000 when I could have wholesaled it. At least understand them enough to know, all right, there's money here. And the fact that you can help that seller out. Yes, we're in business to make money, but let's also be able to help the seller because they need help. So that's on there. And then also I have underneath there, there's a bunch of links uh, to my courses. And because you're listening to the podcast here, you also get 20% off uh, everything that's on there. And if you have any trouble with like, all right, why, what's the difference in this one or that one? You don't understand all that. Send me a message. I don't want you to buy something that's not for you. I hope you make a decision on what's the right thing for you because it's about you going and taking action with it, helping the sellers out and making money. If you just buy it and it becomes shelf help, it doesn't help anyone. Right. The guys, this is a, don't ignore this niche, right? There, there's opportunities out there. There's not as much competition here, right? You can make good money here. So check out, check out Adrian's website, check, you know, and, and, um, Tyrone asked the name of the Dale Carnegie book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I think it's one of the best selling books of all time. Yes. Like up there with the Bible. Right? Yeah. It's like, for sure. You know, one of my favorite things about that book, there's a chapter about smiling on it, mm -hmm. which when I went to read it, I was like, this is stupid, but it's so simple, yet we don't smile enough. And how some of the practices in it are so incredibly simple that we don't do enough. And if you just smile more, uh, selfishly, you'll be happy. But then outwardly, people will like you more. And then people do business with who they know, like, and trust, just like right. the book teaches us. Yeah. We, we've talked a lot about books and a lot about Adrian's, you know, his stuff. And I'm going to tell everybody a secret. And I learned uh, early on in my career. When you read these books and you read Dale Carnegie or you read the, what was the other one? The feel, feel the fear, do it anyway. Any book you read, the very most important part is to implement what you learn, right? You can read it and then put it on the bookshelf and it doesn't do you any good. But while you're reading it, you go, hey, that's a good idea. I'm going to try that today. I'm going to, everybody I talk to, I'm going to smile. I'm going to be, I'm going to be friendly out boy. So implement everything you read in these books or, or all the things that, that strike a nerve with you. And you think, you know what, I should do that. I couldn't agree more. You know, in the entrepreneur world, we have a lot of like high D high energy people in the world. And it became, well, I read 50 books this year. Or I'm going to read a hundred books. You know, like it's all about big, big, big. And I got caught up in that for a bit. And as a slow reader, that's really difficult. And I switched years ago I don't track how many books I read anymore. And my goal is to read less books, but implement more yeah. of the book. Yeah. Most and people read a book. easier for me. Most people read a book and, and a month later, they'll say, oh, this was a great book. And you say, tell me something was in it. And they can't name a thing. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Right. So, so practice it because if you do it, like, you know, I talk a lot about Zig Ziglar. The reason I remember with Zig Ziglar is because I implemented. I would do what he said to do, right? And it paid off. I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe this works, right? And Zig Ziglar is one of the best salespeople there is. Yeah. And I didn't realize that until I listened to it through the filter of he's selling. One of my mentors said Zig Ziglar is all about sales. I'm like, no, he's not. He's all motivation. And when you listen to it, that's how clean he feels. You don't feel dirty after he just sold you on some items. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. He's great. Dale Carnegie's great. But uh, yeah, put implement it, guys. So, uh, man, I could talk to you all day, but I'm not going to keep you. I know you don't feel good. You probably need to go take a nap now because I will. <laughs> yeah. But I would love I would love to have you come on again and let's let's talk some more. Let's talk about, you know, next time you're on, let's talk about lifestyle REI and, and get into, you know, branding yourselves and, and um, you know, some other topics. But Yeah, I, I do. Uh, I forgot to mention earlier, probably because I have a little bit of the brain fog. When you go to the website there, the lifestyle-rei.com slash partners, I do have a course on how to market yourself like a pro. And you're getting more than 20% off for the people who are listening live. And it's going to last for another week or so. You're getting $100 off, which is way more than 20% because you're going to get come to that live on Zoom. And it's a workshop. So you have to come prepared to fill in some blanks, 
you know, go through because the yellow shirt is intimidating for a lot of people. So I don't want you to do it. People think it's all about, you know, this yellow shirt and be bright <laughs> and everything. It's not because if you do it and it doesn't feel good for you, it'll never work. So I do have that live and you get the recording. So if you're listening to it later, you can still get the recording portion of it. But that is going to be more than 20% off right now. And I'd love to you know, help as I can. Uh, you and I have had such good conversations offline. I knew today was going to be awesome. And I also knew that even though I wasn't feeling well, because you have good energy, it would help bring me up. And I wasn't that concerned about feeling a little off. If it was going to be someone that maybe had a little lower energy, I might have had to cancel. <laughs> the energy that you bring. So thank you. No, oh, I had a, I had a great time. So everybody, uh, you know, thank you, uh, Barbara. I saw your comments. Uh, Barbara said there's mobile homes in Washington state for a million bucks. So if you want to look at that market. <laughs> yeah. In California, they just closed up. I think it was a year or so ago. One of the most expensive or highest price mobile homes. They were selling for, I think two and a half million with lot rent. Yeah. But they had an amazing view. Yeah. So oh, I want one in Key West and they're a half a million bucks down there. Yeah. So, right. So, but, but anybody, uh, you know, anyway, thanks for watching everybody. Um, you know, I really, I really appreciate it. Uh, sign up to uh, Wholesaling Partners if you're not already a member there. And uh, Adrian, I look forward to talking to you again really soon. Awesome. Right. Appreciate you, man. Thanks everybody.